So um, hi, we're at TC Team um, 7477 Super 7, and here we're here today with um, Mr. Chris Rake, who is the Vice President of FIRST. So um, we're just going to go ahead and introduce our team. I'm Park. I'm the Programming and Outreach Lead of the team. Um, um, I'm Yug. This is my second year on the team. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, my name is uh, Aiden Salazar. This is my first year on the team, and I'm just kind of been around everywhere. I've been with programming, with hardware, with social media, and with outreaches. Uh, my name is Pernay. This is my fifth year on the team. I'm the lead designer and hardware person, and uh, I'm excited for the season two. It's been a while, so it's uh, going to be interesting how this last season plays out. So, Aiden, would you like to start with the questions? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the first question we had for you today was, uh, what initially drew you into the robotic scene or into FIRST? And uh, if you could just talk about the pathway that you took to get to your position today. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, let me do some introductions. So, uh, hello, Super 7. Uh, it's really good to see you again. See you again. Trying to remember, I think the last time I may have interacted with your team, directly might have been as a judge advisor down in South Super Regional many years ago, because I definitely remember Super 7 being around, and that would have been in Georgia at the time. I think you're in, in Florida, is that right? Yes. All right, excellent. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to chat with you again. Um, so um, first, a few introductions. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Rake. I am the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President at FIRST. And, uh, but that's just the, the, the last bit of my journey. And uh, you want to talk a little bit about how I got here. Um, I think you kind of have to go back in time a little bit to uh, over 20 years ago when I graduated out of college. Uh, I went to Georgia Tech and got an electrical engineering degree. And I started working uh, for a company called National Instruments in Austin, Texas. And I was an electrical engineer and I was doing board level design and, uh, and was doing everything from board layout, schematic entry, firmware, CPLDs, those types of things. And, um, and after a few years, National Instruments, which uh, had some technology that was associated with, with Lego, uh, said, hey, why don't we start having staff go into local schools and start helping them use lego robotics for various things and so i said well that sounds fun how who can say no to lego and robots right like that's a perfect combination like i like lego i like robots so let's go and uh, and so i ended up going to a local middle school and and helping their science teacher uh, and we used uh, lego robotics for uh, at that time I think there were like environmental science types things, and they actually had like a science fair and everything. Um, and I really enjoyed that. But it wasn't first Lego League at the time. That was just using Lego robotics, and these were the RCX bricks, the yellow bricks. You know, in terms of the age. Um, and then like first Lego League was was a thing, and we didn't have first Lego League in Central Texas, but National Instruments really wanted to bring first Lego League. They were, I believe, one of the um, title sponsors of the program at the time. And uh, and so I joined the planning committee and I started working on bringing First Lego League into Central Texas. And I was one of many that were on that, that project. And really, it was more on logistics and, and eventually on the refereeing crew. And I did that for many years. And it was really enjoyable. My day job as an electrical engineer, I went into, uh, eventually moved into data acquisition in the embedded control team and started working on a platform called Compact Rio. And um, in 2007 or so, we got a, a note that said, hey, uh, can you go talk to Dean Kamen? Because he, he, has, uh, he has a need for some new control system hardware. And so I was on a plane. Next thing I know, I'm talking to Dean. And shortly thereafter, Compact Rio was being worked on as, as the control system for FRC. And that was one of my products that I was project managing. And so I was very involved in that. Fast forward. My day job and my volunteer and my job really started to become kind of one and the same. And anyways, I was volunteering during nights and weekends. You know, I was mentoring teams. I was volunteering at events. And meanwhile, the technology that I was working on at National Instruments was going to do many things, including help support first, including the Robo Rio, uh, which was a product that that I was on. And and those my world was very much like. My day job and my night, my my volunteer was all aligned, and it was it was wonderful. 
Um, and I really fell in love with the mission at this point too. So I, I, I was, I was a, a dedicated hardcore event volunteer and, and team mentor. And, um, and then one day I got a note that said, hey, they've got an opening for vice president of programs in Manchester. And I said, look, this is like, you gotta take your one shot. Like this is your once in a lifetime opportunity to, uh, to, to make a significant change. It's not gonna come up that often. So I said, well, I really love this mission. I really love this program. So let's let's talk about committing to the next stage of my career to really uh, helping advance the mission. And uh, and they said yes, and I said yes. And I moved the, the family up to New England. And that was about five years ago. And since then, uh, I've been working uh, full time on, on helping first, grow first, uh, develop the programs, and, and really expanding the footprint of our mission. Uh, to now uh, over 600,000 students in a community of over a million. So uh, it's it's really been quite an adventure, but but not one that I started from college directly to first. It was definitely this wandering route that went through um, as many journeys in life happen happen to do. So, but that that's a little bit of my story of how I I came to be at first. Yeah, what what an amazing journey. First, let me say, sounds like you know, sounds like 20 years, amazing long time to be invested into first and invested in the space and um leading on to my next question um you know COVID-19 hit hard hit everybody you know that was really something that negatively affect you know the world as a community and um leading into that you know how did COVID-19 affect first and you know I know that there's problems with the supply chain and shortages and shortages shortages in tech um can you just explain how that affected first as a company and as a community yeah, for sure. When I joined FIRST in 2018, I did not anticipate, no one anticipated that we were going to have this pandemic. It was such a dramatic impact to every aspect of, of, of our lives. And you mentioned supply chain, but I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about FIRST, right? So FIRST is a, has a series of programs that are mentor-led, hands-on, in-person experiences with a culminating event at a time when you couldn't meet in person. You're not allowed to touch anything. You're not allowed to travel anywhere. You're not allowed to go anywhere. So how in the heck are you going to deliver the life-changing experiences of FIRST when the fundamental things that we use to deliver our program and really impact those that participate are simply not available? And so we very quickly had to come up with ways that we can keep our community together because that really was core. If we lose our community, right, community is first and we are our community. And so we needed to maintain our community and we needed to, to that includes engaging, but also providing experiences that continued to be aligned with the mission to kind of get us through the pandemic. Um, and so we very quickly came up with, in the first tech challenge, we came up with remote gameplay, right? Where everyone could play the game literally made out of cardboard in their living room. And we had a lot of people do that. So we had to come up with the technology for that, the, the judging um, and the remote judging. And that was similar to First Lego League. We had to do something similar there. And then in first robotics competition, we created three entirely new challenges. Um, one of which was the innovation project that First Tech Challenge also had during that period. So we really pivoted hard and fast. Now it happened in the mid season. Uh, now First Tech Challenge in 2020, most areas were already done, but not everybody. But of course, championship was impacted. All the off season was impacted. And then when we got back to school, like, like a lot of people didn't come back to school. They almost missed an entire year where it was remote. And so we really needed to have something that was flexible, deployable, and, and could continue. Because if, if we lost the momentum of our teams, it would be many, many, many years for us to be able to recover. Now, there were a lasting impacts. Now, that disruption really lasted for a year. The second year, we still had remote. In fact, we still have remote gameplay today. But the second year, most were, in the most cases, it was like 80% were remote in, in the first year of the pandemic, and 20% were in person. The, the second year of the pandemic, it was the other way around. 20% were remote, like 80% were in person. So we kind of saw that recovery. Um, but we still had to maintain those tools, still had to maintain uh, the, the half game and the, the remote you know, game rules and all of that. But then we started having some really long-term impacts. So one, people get back to school. That's great. And, and teams can meet again, which is fantastic. But there were a lot of a lot of educators who left. There were a lot of you know I know in my school we had a lot of teachers retired. Um, we had a lot of there were a lot of people burned out. There were a lot of parents burned out. A lot of coaches burned out. A lot of a lot of educators burned out. 
Um, and so we had to kind of rebuild some of the support that goes into making first happen. And then the supply chain issues happened, right? Like, I don't know about you, but like toilet paper was not a thing that you could buy for a while there during the pandemic. And very shortly that turned into semiconductors and semiconductors turn into turn all the electronics, into electronics, refrigerators, stoves, cars, you name it. Almost every aspect of our electronic ecosystem was impacted and we were not alone. So the, the, the control hub um, in particular was really impacted by this. And this, this is like, we had a list of like 30 or 40 components that we could not get. And Rev was amazing. They, they were working the phones, they were talking to distributors, they were securing parts left and right, but it came down to a handful of parts. And if you're missing just one, you don't have a product. You gotta have everything. And so um, we started working on ways that we can uh, accommodate that, you know, teams that had spares, share the spare the spare program that we said, you know, so you have a spare, share it. Um, and then uh, we evaluated alternative, you know, designs, redesigning the, 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 the hardware so that we don't, we can get rid of the parts that were, that were, that were uh, unavailable. But as the supply chain caught up, all of a sudden there was a surplus of parts on the market. And we were able to very quickly then apply those into our own supply chain. And by we, I mean, Rev really drove a lot of this. Um, and now we do not have a supply chain issue with Control Hub. There are still some lingering supply chain things. And a lot of that has to do with like shipping. Like a lot of it gets, goes, goes by ocean. And so there, you know, anytime you have a delay and with logistics and whatnot. So, but those delays are usually very brief now in duration. Um, we're really waiting for a container to show up at this point. Um, now, is the supply chain issues behind us? We hope so, but never say never, right? I think that anything to show the pandemic has demonstrated that, you know, you think you can be prepared, but there are going to be a lot of surprises that come along the way, and and you're going to have to think fast in order to uh, come up with solutions. Solutions. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree. And um, so, talking so, more talk about like how you engage with schools in the community, could you talk about how um, you know engaging schools like middle schools and high schools with STEM? and how that um, helps like create a more strengthened community? Absolutely. I mean, as I said earlier, one really of the first really strongest strong. attributes is our community. Um, and, and you have to think, like, within like, community, a lot of people think, like, you know, what's happening in, in Central Florida, or what's happening up in, in the Manchester area in New Hampshire. Um, and, and yeah, that, that is our community. The first transcends that, we're really a global community. And we're in over 100 countries. And First Tech Challenge is in, in most of those. And you know, we think about how do we make the community stronger? And a lot of that you know, promotion of the community um, really comes down to trying to kind of make the connections. And a lot of schools and a lot of the school programs will be like, okay, we're gonna focus on our team or we're gonna focus in like our like class or with the boundaries of, of the walls of our, of our institution. And one of the things that I think is really important for us and our ethos and our culture is to say that the participating in FIRST is more than just participating in your team. It's your participation in this global community of, of others and really helping each other, you know, gracious professionalism and all the other terms that you're really familiar with, we mean that. And so one of the things that we have to do as we go through this, and by we, by the way, I mean all of us, including you and, and others in the community, because there's only so much we can do at headquarters. Most of the communication actually happens at the local level, is to demonstrate why first works, what makes us different than others. And the community and that sense of community is really, really important. But a lot of schools are going to be thinking about the needs that they have and you got to solve for both of that you got to solve for what are the schools looking for what are the opportunities that are presented and then tie that back into the sense of a global community um and so i'll get back to community in a minute but on the schools we think about what are they looking for they're looking for stem engagement they're looking for uh workforce readiness or career uh preparation they're looking for certification so how do we engage with schools? One, conversations with administrators and decision makers about why first is what, what it is, the impact that we have. We've got this incredible longitudinal study, goes back 10 years, it shows how first kids or first students are significantly better prepared for a world of STEM than their peers. And the only difference is one group went through first and the other one didn't. 
And that's incredible finding. So we have that conversation with the schools and say, how can you say no to this? This is gonna be a life-changing experience for your students. That's what we're all here to do, right? So part of that is that conversation. that conversation, but we also know that the schools have other things that they need to satisfy, right? So we're talking about career technical student organizations or CTSOs, working with parent teacher organizations. Those are also really important because a lot of funding after school programs comes through PTOs. And then we're also talking about like uh, career and technical education uh, and some of the programs that are in place, you know, the, the new shop class, as it were, that they're going to be working on skills that are more like what you see in, in first now. All of that become a menu of options that we can look at when we go talk to schools and say, let's have a conversation. We notice you don't have first. We think first can help in, impact the student lives in these ways. What is what what is preventing you from bringing first into into your school? Like what, what what's going on? And then based on their needs and based on their conversations, we can go through the menu and say, okay, well, here's how we can satisfy some of the things that you're looking for. You're really big on, on certifications. Guess what? Any of our students that go through and they get CAD and use an Onshape or whatever, they can get certified in that. Isn't that great? Those are the types of conversations. And then we need to make sure that once we establish that they feel like they're not isolated, that they're part of that larger community. And that's where all of us come in because you're not part of a community if you're just like on an island all by yourself. So how do you, how do teams locally work together? Not just at the event, but working together to help run workshops, to reach out and assist others. And particularly rookie teams where they're kind of like trying to figure things out. You have a wealth of experience, right? So reaching out and working through really demonstrating things like competition, crisis professionalism, really strengthens that community. And then of course, when you go to the event, you just feel it when you come in. And it's one of those things where when you walk in the doors and you see and you, you see what's happening in the pits, you see what's happening in the field, and you're like, all right, I get it. This, you are something, part of something greater than yourself. And so it's really about the whole package, but it starts with understanding how do you meet the needs of the schools and the educators? Because ultimately they're the ones, if you were talking about schools that are making the decision about bringing the person into the door. Yeah. I completely agree. And um, so I know that, so I know that one of our teammates, Yog, wanted to get in with the fourth question. Sure. Looks like your mic is still muted. Uh, yeah. Um, based on what Aiden said, um, what role do you play in alumni um, in ongoing success, success success during like the first organization, like to keep first running? Yeah, that's a great question. So alumni is a really important part because every participant at some point is gonna become alumni, right? You're gonna graduate out of the program. And and what does that mean? Well, it goes back to community. I mean, we're our community, our community is us. And our alumni are an important part of that because they are the examples of the outcomes that FIRST delivers, right? You're, you're all examples of the incredible impact. Um, so part of this is telling the story, right? Because we just talked about going to schools and saying, why is FIRST different? Why is it, why is it this? Well, let's talk about some people that went through FIRST and hear from them about their life-changing experiences. Alumni are full of stories. We have a, we've worked with around 3 million students over the course of the history of FIRST. That's 3 million stories just ready to be told. And so alumni can help be that real life example of the impact of FIRST and help tell that story. So how do you do this? Well, one, you can probably display your first accomplishment, talk about your first experience, help bring awareness of others about the life-changing experiences at FIRST. But it goes beyond that because alumni, like they like, fell in love with the mission like I did. And so they wanna help support FIRST because, because if you are, in, you are impacted by this, and I hope that everyone has a positive experience and says, FIRST changed my life in these ways, don't I want others to be impacted by this? So how can I help enable that? Well, I can share my stories. I can come volunteer. I can be a mentor of a team. I can help financially support FIRST, whether it's at the local level or at the international level. There are a variety of ways that alumni engage. And again, they become part of that community. That community is now the fabric with which that we, we have that holds this whole organization, this whole mission uh, together. So alumni play a really critical role, but it really will depend on, on the individual as to how they engage. 
Now, if you go back and you go to the events and, you know, you see the alumni patches, you'll see a lot of alumni that are referees or a lot of alumni that are scorekeepers or judges or whatnot. And I think over time, the that is going to continue to grow. And I will say now we're seeing where alumni are now having families of their own. And now their children are ready to go through first. And now we're seeing generations, generations coming in. And it's a really incredible experience where people feel so strongly about this community that they want to stay as part of this community even after their time as a youth participant is over. All right, um, thank you for that. Like, so based off what I just like, what you just explained, um, how does First Robotics like promote diversity and inclusion within its programs and the STEM uh, fields it serves? And what progress has it like made in this area? Yeah, that's a really important question. So we recognize that there's been a lot of progress, but you just look at the demographics that are in engineering and you look at the demographics even, even at, in education and you realize that there's so much there's work so that's much left work to be done, left. right? And no matter how you measure diversity, um, you're going to see that there is a lot of work still ahead of us. So we play and collectively we is not just first, I would say we is everybody, including you. You are first, right? And so that includes our participants, it includes our teams, it includes our volunteers, um, that we are together committed to being able to make it so that first is available to every student, right? And that includes uh, by having a very inclusive, diverse community. Because a lot of people want to participate in programs that are familiar to them or local to them or they're part of their own community or part of their culture. So we need to embrace that. And there's several ways that we do that. Um, one thing I think we have to recognize is that there are real barriers to participation. And it's not just first. There are real barriers in participation in all sorts of areas. There's barriers of participation in other sports. There are barriers of participation in the scouts. There are barriers of participation into band. First, also, there are these barriers. And so what do we do that we can identify these barriers to help promote diversity, inclusion, and equity within FIRST? So some of them are cultural, some of them are social economic, um, but the reality is, is that we all have to work together to overcome that. It's not just the job of one person. So what are some of the things we can do? One of them is our culture and our culture of gracious professionalism. When you really think about this, it's the ethos of encouraging high quality work while emphasizing the value of others and respecting individuals. This is an environment that just embraces diversity straight out and, and equity and inclusion straight out of the gate where it's not just about, you know, the chest bounding, like I'm number one, I'm gonna beat you at all costs. It's really about having a welcoming, embracing and safe environment for everybody to come in. And that is an important aspect of this. We have to create experiences and spaces where everyone's gonna feel safe and welcome because that's gonna help promote and keep a diverse group of participants. And that's not just physical safety, we're talking about emotional safety. And really the importance of the role of caring adults, you know, whether as a coach or a mentor or as a volunteer, it's really, really important that it's, it's this holistic view of embracing a culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion. But there's other things that we can do. For instance, we've got partnerships that we've actively been working on and have established. One of them is with the Human Rights Campaign for LGBTQ Equality. Another one is the UNCF, the yeah. United Negro yeah. College Fund. And that's for establishing first related scholarship funding. We also have reached out and now are working with the American Indian Science and Engineering Society and, and, and for them to be advancing STEM and robotics programming to indigenous people within the United States. So we have established this network of supporters and partners and really identifying back to the question about the school, what are the barriers that they're facing that are preventing or that they're, faced, that they're trying to overcome when it's promoting STEM and career awareness. And that's where we come in and we work with them to get into those communities and support them in a way that they can establish first and sustain it long term. So it's gonna happen within your team. It's gonna happen at the events. It's gonna happen in other areas of the country and the world where we're trying to work with different delivery organizations and different partner organizations to really address some of the core issues that are in that are preventing stem uh engagement with folks that that need it that everyone needs it so that's going to be really really important for us in terms of progress 
you know, reaching out and working with these organizations, we're seeing entire areas uh, that previously did not have access to any STEM activity um, that now suddenly have, I think we got like, there's one area where we've got uh, you know, a dozen uh, schools in a, a Native um, American uh, tribal area that previously had nothing, right? And now we're able to establish first in that region and they're going to have a league and they're going to be able to now develop uh, a footprint in that area and in a sustainable way. And being able to duplicate that story over and over again is going to be really, really important for this. And I think it's important that at the end of the day, we always think about our community and the opportunities that are here. And I'll leave you with this thought. And that is when we think, and we as collectively we, right? It's all of us. When we think about the communities that we are in and that we serve, it's actually more important to be thinking about those that we currently do not serve, because that's who we want to bring in to the community of first. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think now Parth will talk about some of the future of first robotics. Yeah. So, um, so that was I think what you touched on was really very important for sure. It was like um, the diversities we see it like increasing and stuff also. So. As more of like a, you talk about progress with diversity and everything, but looking like overall as like first as an organization, what are some of its like, what are some of first visions for the future? And what are like some places that you see first going in the near future, distant future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that when you think about the uh, reach of first, and you know, we just talked about that we've got a million people in our community. And that may seem like it's huge, like a million people. Can you imagine like a million people? It's like 20 stadiums, you know, huge amounts of people. But if you realize how many students, there's a billion with a B students in the world. So million students and first billion students, you can do the math, you know the ratio, and you realize that it's just scratching the surface. So we are very, very, very far away where every student has access to first and the experiences. And even if you say, okay, well, the global, let's narrow it down to the United States, you're still in single digits in terms of schools that would have a particular program, double digits in terms of the school districts that have first, but really low. Like, you know, we're talking about, you know, 20, 25% of school districts have first. That means 75% don't. That's a huge opportunity. And not only that, I would say as a mission driven organization, I'd say a call to action for us. It's not just an opportunity, it's an obligation that we have to strive to get first, or at least the access of first for every student who wants to participate. And so there are a lot of opportunities here. We also recognize that there are a lot of challenges too. The impact of first doesn't just happen. It requires access to caring adults. It requires volunteers and resources for teams. For teams. And there are a lot of distractions in the world, you know, so there's a lot of noise that's happening and there's a lot of things that can take the eye off of the destination. And so we have to cut through that noise and be able to tell the story of first and then also explain how we are preparing young people for the future with the skills and confidence, confidence and resilience uh, that that help them, you know, build a better world, which is what we're trying to do. So. What does that mean in terms of our vision? If we want to grow first, and that's one of the things that I would say the future of first is growth. We, we are nowhere close to being done. And again, it's that call to action, that obligation for us to not stop until every student wants to access first or has access to first. So what are some of the things we want to do? Well, I mean, there are some of those that think that STEM is about checking a box, right? If I got something in the room that looks like a robot, I'm done, right? Uh, but we feel like that's just the beginning. The, the transformative programming that we've got is more than just touching plastic and metal. It's about the holistic set of skills and experiences that come with a first experience. And it's also about developing the heart so much as developing the mind. And first is positioned in a way that both of those are exercised and developed. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is convincing the world that not only is this important, that first is one of the best ways, if not the best way to solve this need. And so the opportunity is for us and our community and the voice of our million members to make it loud and not give in 
and at most times, you know, recognize it's going to take a couple whacks to knock down that wall. So the vision of first is one where we're just starting in terms of getting first into the hands of students that so desperately need it and want it. And we want to see, you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling our program footprints in the coming years. Yeah, that's definitely a lot more excited to see like four first grows. And I think a lot of that also comes to like a team. So teams locally have to advocate for first in their communities and stuff, which we see a lot of in our communities for sure. So there's a reason why the Inspire Award for FTC is the top award. Mm-hmm. Not robot performance, not the winning alliance captain. Inspire. You are what you celebrate. And at first, we celebrate the team, the team accomplishments, including outreach and development and going beyond robots. We're more than robots, and we mean it. And we mean it by making it our top award. And that's true on any of our programs. First Leg League, First Tech Challenge, First Box Competition, you look at the number one award, and it's not about robot performance. It's about the team, and it's about these holistic sets of experiences and skills and activities that they do that goes beyond the competition. Um, and I think this segues very well, Lisa, just into our next question. So like, we know that first is focused equally or maybe even more on like the non-technical and soft skills that you get from the program. So we know that there's also like, there's programming and robot building, but teams see like other jobs, like there's outreach, social media, documentation and stuff. So, um, could you elaborate a little more on like the soft skills that you've seen that um, people have learned through FIRST along with FIRST? Yeah, I mean, yeah. as we just said, like a lot of people think, you know, FIRST and they think robots. And they think the FIRST is about building robots. And yeah, sure, we've got sure, teams we got building robots. robots. They compete with robots. We're a robotic competition. Uh, and these look like robots. And we talk robots. And it's a community of people that are interested in robots. But it's not about building robots. It never has been. I think it's really, really important to realize that, that this is not about students building robots. It's all about using robotics to build our students. And I think at the end of the day, that is the key. If anything, people take away about why FIRST is different and that has the impact that they do. It's because of that. And that includes all of the skills and you know hard skills soft skills or technical skills versus holistic skills or 21st century skills There's a lot of different ways you can describe this but when people think about these types of skills they're going to be thinking about things like conflict resolution collaboration communication critical thinking sometimes they call them the c skills these are things that come from working as a team on solving really tough problems being able to communicate that to judges, to each other, to your community, during your outreach, that's what gets exercised. You're gonna learn CAD, you're gonna learn 3D printing, you're gonna learn software programming, you're gonna learn vision systems. These are all things that are very technical and you can understand the robot needs that to function. But you're also gonna develop all those other skills. And I think that one of the things that's really important and why I got hooked to this program is because as a judge, I got to see transformation over time with students on a team. And I've got many examples where I would encounter a team and in the corner was a very shy, very reserved student who didn't say anything. They did not have a lot of self-confidence. They didn't even know why they were there. I think they were there because they were told they had to be in the room to put on the shirt and represent the team. Then they experienced the first experience, and I got to see the transformation season after season after season to now that same student is now leading the team. They're leading the presentation. They are a programming lead or an outreach lead. They have self-confidence to the point where you know they are going to be an amazing lead and whatever they, wherever they go. That is what FIRST is all about. And those skills, some of them are technical, but a lot of the things that, that I saw happen in those judging rooms, they were not technical skills. 
those were leadership and life skills. And I think that's something that really stands out at, with first and uh, the first experience. Yeah, and I think also as a team, we've seen that firsthand with like other teams and also our members, just like the total leadership and every, all those skills that you learn. So um, I think if Pranay, do you want to address your questions? So talking more about how we expand beyond robotics as a program, um, I'm sure there are a lot of skills that you've seen teams learn at first, and I'm sure there are other skills that you may have been able to apply to your own job. So what are some skills that you learned in first or saw in first that you applied to your own job or you've seen in the industry? Yeah, I think there's really two important ones. I mean, there's a lot of important skills. And, and, and of course, part of that will depend on the nature of the job. But I think one that's universal is critical thinking. I think that's by far the most important skill. You know, your ability to analyze an issue, collect the evidence, make observations, evaluate the data, and form some judgment that is rational without bias is a really, really important skill to have. And it's not just about first providers. You can say, you look at all the world problems that we've got and you say, you know, no one's saying the one thing we don't need more of are people that can do critical thinking. I think we could hopefully universally agree that the world could use a lot more people that are able to have a critical thought and to be able to use that to help solve the problems. And that's one of the amazing skills that come from the first experience is that ability to develop and apply critical thinking to everything that you do. And I would say that that's something really important that I found in my career uh, and continue to find really, really important is the ability to say, hang on, let me think about the problem. Let me think about what I know, what I don't know, and how can I build enough information for us, for me to figure out what options or what solutions could be applied to this particular problem? I also have to use critical thinking to say solutions that may exist to say, is that really the right approach? Is that going to get us the outcome that we want? Rather than just take things at face value. Critical thinking doesn't mean that you have to doubt everything in the world. Critical thinking means that you're able to analyze the problem and say, yeah, you know what? That does make sense. And I have the evidence and I've gone through the process to get to that conclusion. I think another skill that's really important that comes from, as I mentioned it earlier, is communication. You, you can be an amazing inventor. You can have the, the best, best innovative, ideas innovative ideas in the entire, in the world. entire world. And if you can't communicate that, then there's one person, one person in the world who will understand you, and that's you, maybe, right? Uh, maybe that could be somewhat doubting. Yeah. But let's just let's say just that say you have this great idea and you can't communicate it. It's going to be really hard for you to bring that idea into reality. reality. So being able to communicate ideas and being able to come up with ways to articulate your thoughts and be able to explain that and also bring people along in that journey. And that includes convincing people of ideas, of walking them through the logic of the critical thinking that you just did, of helping educate and inform. Those are all important aspects of communication. And there's not a day that goes by where I don't utilize critical thinking and communication in my job. Both, let's say, in my job, and, and, and in my life, you know, my home life, for instance, it's all about communication. If you're not communicating, you're going to have a rough time. So actually, I'll ask, uh, I thought it was really important how you highlighted those two skills. So just to get a little bit more information on those two skills and how they're used in the job as a first, like as a robotics team, right? Whenever we're designing a robot or planning the next outreach or planning whatever our next step should be, we always try to use like WhatsApp and different communication methods to make sure that we're all like on the same page. So in your job and like when you're working with others, I'm sure you have a lot of people that you interact with um, on the daily. How do you communicate with others and like which like methods do you use to make sure that everybody's on the same page with what you're doing? Well, they're different. There's Okay, so we talk a little bit about communication, the art of communication. So there's a few things to keep in mind. Um, anyone here familiar with network? So you have the ability, if you're on a, a computer network, you can communicate to others on the network by just broadcasting, right? And you're like, UDP, like blah, right? Everyone in the world can hear what you're saying or on your network. 
And then you have like TCP where like you're going to communicate, but I'm not going to be good or satisfied unless you tell me that you've received it. Otherwise, I'm going to keep sending the information until you acknowledge that you receive it. And humans are just like that, right? There's going to be cases where the communication is going to be broadcast. And I'm just going to like shout it out and we're going to announce it. New season, right? Big season reveal. Rules are available. Q&A is open. Get your registration in. Like big broadcast messages. And then there's going to be other cases where we're going to be having conversations where it's really a two-way conversation where I'm going to be saying something, I'm going to get an acknowledgement, I'm going to be listening, I'm going to give an acknowledgement that I'm going to say something, make sure I get an acknowledgement, and you're going to go through that. And I'd say that that's two ends of a spectrum, and different types of communication scenarios are going to fall somewhere between those two ends. And, the, and this is where know your audience is really, really important. Know who you are communicating with. Know their styles of communication know how will they communicate some people communicate visually some people communicate through audio some people only communicate clearly through words people are different and so often communication actually has to come in many different forms or you understand your audience and you tailor the mechanism so that you're both able to participate in that communication and I think that's a really critical part of this. So when you ask about how we communicate, it kind of depends on who I'm communicating with. At work, a lot of our communication is going to be by email. And we use Microsoft Teams, which would be, you know, like Slack or something like that. So everyone's got their own favorite communication tool, but I use Microsoft Teams and a little bit of text messaging on the side. But generally, Microsoft Teams and then in terms of collaboration tools, Microsoft Office and SharePoint and those types of things combined with email is where a lot of my interactions happen outside of meetings and one-on-one -on -one interactions. And that could be in person, over Zoom, however that may be. And then there are times when I'm communicating or we're communicating to larger audiences and that may be more like a webinar or a broadcast or an interview or something along those lines. But the vast majority of my day-to-day -day communications with my coworkers, my as we're working together on the, solving the problems at first, are going to be through interactions like this, through written communication, through email, or sort of this real-time chat communication that will happen via Teams. And it's really a combination of all three. But it comes back to what is it you're communicating, who are you communicating it to, and making sure you're using the right tools to deliver that message. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that covers the communication aspect that you were talking about. And then our final question for you talks a little bit more about the critical thinking that you mentioned. So me personally, as a builder in competitions, a lot of times we've had a lot of stressful situations where something goes wrong with the robot and we have to come and think of a like on the spot of a solution to make sure that we can continue operating it for the rest of the tournament. So yep. first teams are taught to like deal with unexpected challenges on a very frequent basis. And I'm sure there are a lot of times that you had to also deal with and overcome unexpected challenges, for example, COVID-19. So in those challenges, was there anything that like you did that maybe you took away from it and said that this is something that I'm going to continue to do because it really helped me in that situation to get stuff done? Know what is your core mandate. mandate or your core objective. objective. And that can come in many different forms. So Woody uh, would say that in the moment of an ethical crisis, what's important is that you understand, and I'm, I'm, I'm totally butchering the quote, but it's important for you to understand what your own principles and guardrails are that you can apply to make a decision, particularly when the decision itself is not clear what the right answer is going to be. This is where preparation in advance of a issue, like a, uh, an incident that can happen or COVID-19 can go a long way. Because during COVID-19, we very quickly were able to point to and say, our theory of change or how the first delivers its impact, our core values, our gracious professionalism, our ethos, our cooperation. These are things that are unwavering. These are things that 
our, our foundation. Every decision we make is going to be built upon that foundation. And we didn't have to have a big debate about it because we all agree that those are the foundational elements of first. That allowed us to not have to debate whether or not this path or this path was going to be the right thing to do because we had already defined what the right thing to do or what the criteria is that has to be applied to determine if it's something is the right thing to do. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got every single scenario, single scenario mapped out mapped and it's out. going to give you the answer. the answer. And that's where the critical thinking and collaboration and communication comes in. Or being able to use those use guardrails those or those principles, those principles that you've established as an organization to then say, this, this these are the boundary are the conditions. conditions. Now, here are my here options. Are options. Here are the constraints. Here's the likelihood of success. Here are the resources, the resources and the costs and all the other things that are associated with that. And with that framework, now you can apply that to decision making. And you may discover during that time that you, you need more information. Maybe you don't have the answers. You may also discover you don't have enough time to get all the information. It's called analysis paralysis. This is where you get stuck in a situation, you're analyzing it, you're analyzing it, you're analyzing it, and you realize the clock has just run out because you didn't make a decision when you needed to make a decision because you were stuck in a mode of, I just need more information, more information, more information. One of the toughest well, the things toughest that you have, things to you have to do is to say, I need more information because I need to make this a decision. But I have these other constraints. So how far do you go? How much information do you need? And then when you have to make a tough decision, when you don't have as much information as you'd like, who are the people that you can interact with and bring into that decision process as thought partners, as folks that can help reflect upon talk through, make recommendations, but ultimately, and it's really important, you have to know who is in charge of making the decision. Because one of the hazards that you have is when you say, we're going to make this decision, but it needs to be a unanimous vote. And it's a very admirable thing to do because people want to be inclusive, right? Well, you can be inclusive without having to try for a unanimous vote because if you have an anonymous vote, you may end up in analysis paralysis and you're going to be stuck there because you can't get everyone to agree. So you can include people by bringing their ideas and their opinions and have them heard and have them collaborate. But ultimately, one of the things in that framework is how do you make a decision? And there are decision frameworks that are out there. One's called Mocha. There's another one called Rapid. Um, there's uh, these things of like, how do you include different people in this process? But ultimately, there's someone who owns the decision. So let's talk about your robot. Something broke on your robot. What are your conditions? You have X minutes before your next match. You have Y sets of materials that are available. You have different things that you can pursue. None of them are guaranteed to success. What is it you're trying to, to do? Are you trying to get back on the field to be fully functional? Do you think that you're gonna modify your strategy and you're going to use one particular manipulator and leave the other one behind because you can still compete? Maybe you go talk to your alliance partner and say, hey, what are you strong in? Because I have a decision. I can either do A or B and I've got 10 minutes to do it. If you tell me what you're strong at, I'll do the other thing and we can be an amazing pair. That's actually the power of cooperation right there. That's the power of the alliance. And so when that's part of the boundary conditions is you have that as an available resource. So for teams, whether you're a first tech challenge team or a first prize competition team or a team of people working at first or a team working in industry, understanding what are the values of the organization? What are your objectives? What are those guardrails that you can apply in the framework to apply? How do you make decisions? Get that all out of the way, because now because you've got a framework that you can bring into when that moment happens, when that crisis happens, you're not sitting here trying to figure out how you're going to get through it. You can focus on what you're going to do in order to address whatever problem or situation is in front of you. And that is a great merger of critical thinking and communication. Uh, yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. So 
I think that's all the questions that we have for this interview session. We know that you're really busy and that you have a lot of things to do. So we thank you so much for your time and sharing the answers, not just with our team, but also with the first community, because I think this is something that should extend far beyond what we're learning and also to what we're going to be doing after first as well, and hopefully give back to the community in first as well. So thank you so much for doing this and spending your time with us. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to, to, to talk through these really important topics. Um, I hope that you have an amazing season and uh, look forward to, to seeing you at a future event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.